Hello, everyone. Happy Wednesday. It's 720. I'm getting started a little bit later. Notice I didn't say hello, people. I guess I say that a lot because that was one of the things for the flag. Speaking of which, please make sure you go and vote uh, on flag today. Uh, we Not everyone has voted, so uh, I'm trying to, again, get this going so that we can get this done and finished. Um, so please make sure you vote. Some of you have voted for one, but not the other. And my five um, new APUSH people, you know you can't vote for the Euro one, but I have some Euro people that voted for Euro, but not APUSH and vice versa. So please make sure you vote because I want to kind of make a final tally. Um, I'm going through because everybody had brilliant ones and now everybody's voting for brilliant ones. And I'm trying to narrow the list down a bit so that we can finally pick one and hopefully get our flag to our designers before we leave for spring break and they can kind of work on it spring break or at least attempt to and get something going. So anyway, so happy Wednesday. It is already a really nice day outside. I came in without a coat, which is fabulous and awesome. Um, so, and I hope you have a great day too. So get all your stuff done so you can enjoy the day because I really think it's going to be a nice day. All right, on page nine, we were talking about the insular cases as we left. And again, what is important to understand is that as we start to annex these places and as we start to make territory, they again are uh, going to be part of the United States and the people will have that live there will have some of the rights as Americans, but the, const but the Constitution is not guaranteed to them. The Supreme Court says, and it's very important that you highlight that on uh, page 9, um, F2D, the Constitution does not follow the flag. And we have continued to have issues with that. Um, as our country grew and uh, as um, we had to deal with people in those territories saying, hey, you annexed me, I should have all the rights. So we'll continue to watch this play out over the next century as to how the United States deals with these territories. Um, so now we get back to Cuba. So we had told the Cubans, hey, we want to help you get rid of your oppressor. We want to help you... Um, overthrow Spain. Also, it helps us to get Spain out of our hemisphere. And when that happens, you will have your independence. We even added that little Teller Amendment that said, you know, nope, we don't want you. And now we're going to have a little bit of trouble. We're going to put the military. So on page nine, the United States government or the United States military government set up under General Wood will um, work toward helping gain independence. The U.S. is going to withdraw in 1902 to honor the Teller Amendment, but then we're going to add another part of this. It's called the Platt Amendment. And when we leave Cuba in 1902, the Platt Amendment takes place, sought to ensure that Cuba would not be vulnerable to European powers and to maintain U.S. influence in Cuban affairs. So we have the good part, like, hey, Cuba, we're going to help you with your independence, but we want to make sure that we stay in control. So Cuba is forced, forced to write the Platt Amendment into their own constitution. So we write it, we say, you got to put it in your constitution. You have no choice. And the provisions of the Platt Amendment are and they're very important and significant as we start to read down. Cuba bound itself not to Im impair their independence by treaty or uh, contracting a debt beyond their resources, so you can't get in debt with any other country. U.S. government had a right to approve all Cuban treaties. Wow, that's pretty big. U.S. could send troops to restore order and to provide mutual protection anytime we want it. Cubans promised to sell or lease needed cooling or naval stations, most importantly, Guantanamo Bay. And Cuba did, in the 1960s, overthrow its own government. It became a communist country helped by the Soviet Union. Um, we almost come to World War III over Cuba, which will get the Cuban Missile Crisis in the 60s. But we have always maintained and controlled Guantanamo Bay, and we still do today. It's an important very important part, especially during the Cold War, base 
that we retain from Cuba. But hopefully you see, is Cuba independent? I don't think so. So nationalism after the Spanish-American War. Now, this is going to be a comparison of after the War of 1812, when we had that whole nationalism. We called it the era of good feelings. And we're going to have something very similar after the Spanish-American War. Um, this splendid little war. Um, we're going to establish now this overseas empire. Uh, the uh, feeling in the United States, again, is very reminiscent of that era of good feelings. European powers give us more respect. We enhance that Monroe Doctrine. Latin America, however, is deeply suspicious, as they should be. Britain becomes an ally. This is when the United States and Britain really forge their ally. That We've always had a type of alliance with Great Britain, but it's not always been um, a uh, alliance of mutual respect. So now we have that. Um, Philippines drew U.S. into Asian affairs, and that is going to be a big thing. Uh, if you look, please make sure that you note D, because that is going to be one of the places that will be disastrous for the United States. We build this gigantic Navy, huge Navy. Um, war helped heal the rift between the North and South. That's very important. I think I mentioned that uh, yesterday. Um, and nationalism uh, is the result of an urban mass culture industrial society. Like this thing is playing like on all cylinders. We've got mass culture. We've got political uh, uh clout. We've got all these things that are going towards expanding this feeling of superiority after the war, the Spanish-American War. <clears throat> However, we're going to have a little problem in Asia. And Asia is going to be what draws a lot of our attention in the next 10 years, starting first with the Philippines. So I kind of sort of hinted at that things were not going to go great in the Philippines for the United States and especially the Filipinos. They thought they were going to be independent. We kind of felt like, no, that's not a good place in the world for you to be independent because we're really worried about Germany, that Germany is going to take, let's just start taking all those countries. So Filipinos assumed that they would be granted freedom and that is not going to be the case. Senate narrowly blocked the resolution and the Philippines become a protectorate. And a protectorate is exactly what it sounds. It's a country that we protect. We, we as a country, as the United States, feel like uh, you're not able to govern on your own. You need guidance. You need um, help to keep you safe from other countries. Um, it's kind of condescending. Uh, I hope you can see that. And the Filipinos do not take this very well. They had been an imperialist, an imperialist colony of Spain for almost 500 years, and they were ready to be done and get finished with that. So as a result, and it says the Filipinos tragically deceived. I mean, they fully believed 100 percent that they were going to be their own country and rule their own country. So what happens is open rebellion. And again, when we tell the story, we use the words like rebellion and insurrection. Filipinos in their history would not use the same words. They would use independence. They would use revolution, like we were trying to overthrow. Uh, and for anti-imperialist, they will bring those words up as well. They will say, uh, this is kind of similar to the Declaration of Independence and Sons of Liberty that we did in 1776 to overthrow our oppressor, who we felt didn't let us run our own stuff. And so again, history is a sticky wicket, depending on who's telling the story. And again, we say rebellion, but I hope and I want you to think of how that would be perceived to the people in the Philippines. So, um, because what the Filipinos are going to do is exactly what we did. We're independent. We're independent. And as much like Great Britain said to us, no, you're not. We say the same to the Filipinos. Savage fighting. This fighting in this uh, uh, insurrection in the Philippines will be so much worse than the Spanish-American War. More lives lost. The brutality that the United States inflicts on the Filipinos will be horrendous. Um, savage fighting. 
Filipino rebels will flee into the jungles and they will wage a vicious guerrilla warfare. And it will be awful. They'll bomb buildings. They'll interrupt supply lines. They'll place bombs to, uh, to uh, attack uh, soldiers. And so as a result, it's kind of like those of us that uh, are siblings that had a um, cause I'm the oldest, as you all know, my little sister could just pick the heck out of me and nag me and I'm not touching you and all this other stuff until brr, explosion. And that's kind of what happened to the United States army. They, uh, felt the brunt of all these small guerrilla attacks that were successfully in disrupting, killing, um, uh, blowing up things. And their response was, we're just going to take care of this all at once. And some of the things that they would do, again, uh, burn villages. They would just go into a Filipino village and burn the village to the ground. Not combatants, not people that were fighting them. We're just going to burn everybody. Families, grandmas, children. Um, and as a result, you can see 57,000 Filipinos dead. That's not combatants. That's not meeting on a, on a battlefield. That's civilian and combatants that are going to uh, die, as well as 4,300 Americans, which is almost more than, well, it's more than died of combat fatalities in the Spanish-American War. That's at about 400. Um, when we add diseases, that goes up to 5,000. But this 4,300 will be casualties uh, and deaths as a result. Anti-imperialists, they say this is what we told you would happen if we went in a place where we shouldn't be and we shouldn't be doing this. Uh, the U.S. fight to free Cuba morphed into a war 10,000 miles. So this is what this thing is going to drag us into. Uh, the insurrection was finally going to be broken when they finally uh, arrest uh, Aguinaldo and he will be captured. We then make a commission to make appropriate recommendations. So, you know, we're following like, what should we do? And the governor is now going to, or I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. Taft uh, will lead that commission. And again, using terms like our little Brown brothers, which in 1901 would have been um, uh, widely accepted and would have been seen as uh, a opening embrace of the, the, the Filipino people. Obviously, we don't see it that way today. The United States is going to institute education, sanitation, public health, infrastructure, do a lot of things, health care. Um, but at the same time, we should know that education is not going to be in the Filipino language, Tagalog. It's not going to be about the history of the Philippines. It's going to be a reproduction of school in the United States. The flip side of that is very positive, though, for some Filipinos. They'll be able to join uh, the United States military. There is a gigantic presence of Filipinos in the United States Navy even today. It's one of the uh, things that uh, the Philippines and the United States have always had a mutual agreement on, and the uh, especially the United States Navy. I don't know about the other branches, but the, the United States Navy is well represented by people from the Philippines. Finally going to get their independence July 4th, significant, in 1946, and that will be after World War II. And we, can, may, we still maintain a, a military presence in the Philippines, not as much and as strong as we did bef uh, before, but... Um, we do have a very strong military presence in the Philippines because it, of the strategic location. And we'll use the Philippines especially, I know I'm going far ahead, we're going to use the Philippines especially during Vietnam. That'll be a crucial place uh, for both uh, men and women moving in and out of Philippines and then also for hospitals. So now we're going to move to our next place in Asia that will be uh, difficult for the United States, and that will be China. So while the United States was um, having their civil war and reconstruction and beginning our golden industrial age, the rest of the world, Europe, is moving into Asia and carving it up. It's called carving up the melon. And the reason being is because when China closed its doors to Westerners, it helped and protected them for centuries. But it also 
kept them out of the industrial age. So China has not moved forward as far as technology or industry. And so when these European nations come in, they are easily taken over by um, Germany, France, Britain, and Russia. What those four countries want are the materials out of China. Tea, jade, ivory, silk, a couple other things, maybe opium. But that's what they want, and they want the ports. And what they don't want is China's interference. And so what they do is they just go in, they carve up a place and say, this is the territory of Germany in China. And in that territory, China has no authority, none. The problem now is the United States wants in. And those four countries in particular say, sorry, we got all the stuff and you can't have any. All of those uh, parcels are on ports uh, where things are easy to move out. It's not interior land. It's not any place that's right along the coast. It's all, it's Hong Kong. That's why Great Britain had Hong Kong forever. It's Shanghai. It's all the places along the coast. And the United States says, hey, we really should be allowed to be in there. So at the top of page 11, it's called the open door policy. That's the policy that the United States wants. So foreign powers in China lured by huge Chinese markets, and they do sell things to China. But more importantly, they want stuff out of China. Secondary is converting Chinese to Christianity. Uh, and they will be semi-successful at that, but not for long periods of time. So there will be two groups of people. There will be people trying to make money in China, and then there will be a large group of missionaries that will be working in and around that area. So by the late 19th century, Japan and Western, uh, Western European powers had carved China into spheres of influence, and that's what they're called. So that influence means when you step into this, this territory occupied by Great Britain, technically you're on British soil. No Chinese laws apply. Uh, Great Britain cannot be held to Chinese laws, and you have to abide by British laws. And that is unheard of in a, in a native country. We would never allow that to happen. And none of those countries would have ever allowed that to happen in their country. So um, the United States manufacturers feared Chinese markets would be monopolized by Europeans. And yes, that is exactly what has happened. So our Secretary of State, in this heightened feeling of we now are a superpower, we write a letter. And it's called the Open Door Note. John um, Hay writes this letter. And because, uh, again, we're at a disadvantage. And the letter urges all the great superpowers to announce that in their spheres of influence, they would respect certain Chinese rights and deal of fair competition. Um, in effect, when any great power dealt with a foreign trader, it would observe the open door. Obviously, everybody in the United States loves the open door note. Like, yes, that's the way it should be. Obviously, nobody else listened. Why would they listen? No. Like, write your little piece of paper. We don't care. We're here. And so it doesn't do anything. That open door note is again to the United States, like, hey, here we are, and then boom, slam the door back in our face. Like, we're not listening to you. We still don't have enough of the um, uh, clout to make other nations really listen to us when we're doing that. So again, this is a time, the open door note, love to ask you questions about it. What does it do? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Uh, none of the foreign powers listen. While all that's happening, if you look at the bottom of page 11, we have this thing called the Boxer Rebellion. So first and foremost, we, again, as a Western uh, hemisphere, do not make it any, make any attempt to understand Eastern culture. And so when we see what is really martial arts, we just call it boxing, right? It's not boxing. The Boxer Rebellion is a misnomer about the martial arts, and we call them secret societies, but they're really just uh, the collection of the young men under uh, either a sensei or a dojo 
learning martial arts. And when we see that as Westerners, we think it's boxing. That's the only thing we can compare it to. So think of that when we talk about the Boxer Rebellion. So this happens in 1900 at the turn of the century. Millions of Chinese are eventually enraged over that open door policy that everybody should just be let in and everybody should have competition. Um, and these young men, and they're young men, they're probably 15 to 25 years old, uh, Chinese nationalists finally saying, get out of our country, you white people. This is not your place. And they begin attacking the one thing that they feel is the most uh, damaging to Chinese culture and heritage, and that would be missionaries, right? Trying to convert people to Christianity. And so they start killing missionaries. Now, most of those missionaries happen to be a lot of Catholic nuns. And when that happens, that sets the world on fire. There is nothing that sets the world on fire like young men, first of all, killing young women as it should, as well as when you add uh, missionaries on top of that. So we get this giant multinational force that will descend upon China. Um, about 18,000 are going to start to arrive. And uh, Japan, Russia, Britain, France, United States, everybody sends um, troops to put down this rebellion in China. And again, it's another attempt to control this Asian country. No one's going to control China. It's too big and it's too hard. So the allies are victorious and they say to China, you have to pay. Like you did this, we beat you and you have to pay 33, 300, I'm sorry, $333 million. And the United States is going to get $24.5 million. Um, U.S. will eventually forgive that money. Chinese will set it aside. And now at the bottom, we are under this open door policy that would embrace territory integrity of China, sought to eliminate carving of, up of China after the Boxer Rebellion. No formal real acceptance. China is spared uh, partition during these years. Again, and China will be allowed to stay. And I think that's for the end of the day. Yep. So I always like to tell you about awesome movies, about especially this time period. There's two really good ones. One is called The Last Emperor of, of it's just called The Last Emperor, I think. Uh, and it's about this time period um, as told by China. It is, I think, from the 1990s and it, it won uh, Academy Awards. It's a beautiful movie. It's very long and I will tell you it's very slow. And so probably a lot of you won't appreciate it, used to all your killings and superheroes flying in and changing things and it never makes sense. You really look at those superhero movies. They don't make sense. Anyway, it's a very great, it's a great movie. It's called The Last Emperor. Those of you that appreciate beautiful movies with great cinematography, you will love The Last Emperor. It's gorgeous. Then our other movie is called The Sand Pebbles and it's about the Boxer Rebellion as told from the point of view of the United States Navy. And it's made in the 1960s uh, with Steve McQueen, who at that time was box office awesomeness. And it's a great movie. That's obviously a little more fast paced because it has the actual war parts of it and includes some of these missionaries and the take on this uh, sailor who uh, who sees both sides of this this uh, war. He has friends that are Chinese nationalists that work on the ship with him. He has interaction with missionaries and it's a really great movie. Uh, it's called The Sand Pebbles. It's awesome. So. I will end this now. Uh, please make sure you do the exit ticket. It's the exit ticket that says one thing I learned, two questions I like. Uh, you guys are really good with those questions. I appreciate that. Uh, make sure, again, those I've got, I think the last one graded. Please note that this just isn't a completion grade because some of you didn't get the full points for that. Um, and make sure you get your music videos turned in. Tomorrow we're taking our SAQ test. So be prepared for that as well. And as always, if you have any questions, please let me know. And I hope you have a great Wednesday and get outside and join the fresh air. Okay, see you tomorrow.